first stock market crash in history was in 1792. On this day, it's March 19th, 2022 today, but in 1792, it was the first stock market crash in history. On that day, uh, it was called Black Monday, and on that day, uh, treasuries dropped 10%. Uh, and securities dropped 12%. So what had happened is uh, the bank, the U.S. bank, I think it was called at the time, it was basically like the Fed. They had, uh, they, they'd made it, they'd incentivated speculators to invest. And so some speculators weren't able to pay um, their, their dues they got over leveraged and it caused it caused a crash and so then after that Hamilton Alexander Hamilton who was the secretary of the Treasury he put in place some incentives uh, for people to use credit it's a very similar story uh, as what we have seen in the last many years with the US Fed so it's on this date in 1792, it was the first market crash. This week, I'm posting a little history of market crashes. So you can see from the very beginning, uh, from 1792, the very first crash in the US stock market, you get to see a whole timeline, a history of all of the crashes. So check it out at missionalmoney.com. I'm going to include a link in this week's podcast, the Missional Money Podcast. So check it out. It's a, it's part of the ongoing series, training series at uh, the University of Houston and also at Make Your Money Count, the, the online course that we're offering. Currently, it's free. You can sign up at missionalmoney.com. Uh, and I'm going to include this lesson, this history lesson of stock market crashes. But I just thought it was interesting as I'm working on this series, this training series for investing, investment strategies. Uh, and <laughs> this week in the stock market, this whole month has been kind of crazy. March of 2022 has been pretty crazy. And in fact, just this week, just a few days ago, the Fed raised interest rates 25 basis points in an attempt to curb the inflation that's happening in uh, the economy. Pretty high, 40 year high inflation. And nothing will mess with uh, the stock market more than inflation. And the Fed raising interest rates, that's a big it's a big problem for the stock market. The stock market will eventually uh, demonstrate the pain of the Fed. The Fed has made quantitative easing uh, so, they've made the availability of money so easy uh, and so cheap by keeping interest rates artificially low. And the federal government has been spending like a drunken sailor for I don't know how long, as long as I've been alive, but it's getting worse and worse and worse. And this week, the president, that's Biden, President Biden, and all of the folks who surround him are trying to tell us that they're big, huge $1.5 trillion spending bill that increased the budget yet again. They're trying to tell us that it's the first time in a long time, maybe historically, I believe Biden said, that they've reduced the deficit. They didn't reduce the deficit. They reduced the increase <laughs> from last year. So that it's like if you're spending, uh, if you're making $100,000 a year and you're spending $300,000 a year, and this year you create a new budget and you only spend $275,000 a year because last year you spent $300,000 a year and you only make $100,000 a year, that's called uh, Biden economics, I guess. They're saying that 
this is a historic reduction in the deficit. So if you want to know what drives the stock market and what makes stock markets crash, pay attention to the Fed, pay attention to what they're doing. And basically they're coming to the show a little bit late. I'm glad they did what they did. 25 basis point increase is helpful. The market loved it because the market probably had priced in a bigger rate increase. That's what I think. What do you think? So again, in 1792, the first stock market crash, Alexander Hamilton was a secretary of tr the treasury and the same things were happening then. The federal government was trying to incentivate people to spend money to grow the economy and they created a bubble and that created or attracted speculators in the market. And those speculators then got over leveraged and couldn't, couldn't do what they were obligated to do, pay their bills. And so there was basically a crash because they got too big to fail, basically. It's not that different than what we saw in 2008 and over and over in history. And it's the federal government that tends to create the problem. And now, today, in 2022, the federal government is trying to fix the problem with the little bit of medicine that today, this week rather, was uh, <laughs> like a little bit of sugar to make the medicine go down because it was such a small rate increase by the Fed. <clears throat> but we're going to see many more. That's what they're telling us. And this week, and the market loved it, last week and the week before, in fact, last week, we announced that the market, the stock market, was headed for a major correction because the technical indicators, the support levels that were breached, and I'm going to go into all of this in the in the course on investing and investment strategies. And it's, you know, again, it's free. You can check it out at Missional Money. You can get enrolled at missionalmoney.com. I'm going to go into investing, investment strategies, and I'm going to talk about, you know, how you pay attention to some important indicators like the death cross and support levels and resistance levels. And these are called technical analysis and they're important uh, for investors, especially for traders. I'm gonna talk about trading, time frames for uh, trading. That's investing, investing and trading are a little bit different. I'm gonna teach, uh, teach a lesson on that as well. In fact, I'm creating a trader manifesto. You can check that out at tradermanifesto.com. I'm going to post, I'm going to create, and I'm going to post a trader manifesto. And I'm going to outline the rules, boundaries, and limitations that I know work for trading in the stock market. And everything I've learned in my career as a financial advisor and an investment manager working on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley in the wealth management department and before that as the first certified financial planner at State Farm uh, who was a State Farm agent, the first and only certified financial planner in the Houston area for State Farm. Uh, I learned a lot about investing. I had a securities license back then, 1997 is when I got my first, when I got my securities license. And I worked for State Farm. So imagine, if you will, that you hired me as your investment advisor. Now, I had good intentions. And the people who trained me had good intentions. They were good people. The problem was they were in a system, just like I was, that incentivated selling. We were incentivated to sell. and. My contract at State Farm as a State Farm agent uh, really paid me well 
if I sold financial services. Now you would think because I was a State Farm agent that I got paid for selling car insurance and home insurance, which is true, but what State Farm did, just like every financial services company does, is they threw on some heavy duty bonuses for agents who would sell financial services. One of the reasons I left State Farm is because back then we had 15 proprietary mutual funds. Now remember, I was a certified financial planner, so I could sell only what a captive agent was allowed to sell. A captive agent means that you are, uh, you're captive. You're, uh, you're basically attached to the rules, boundaries, and limitations of the insurance company you work for. And even though I had a securities license, and even though I was a certified financial planner, I could still only recommend products that were proprietary to State Farm. So think about that. If you were my client, and I had a lot, I was a top producer. I was a top producer of mutual fund sales because I believed in our product. I called it the couch potato proof investment. It was a mutual fund. It was one of those uh, time, what do you call it? Time horizon funds. There's many of them out there, but basically it adjusts according to whichever one you bought. It was a life path fund. So you could buy a 2050 fund and that basically would mature and get more conservative as you got older so that in 2050 it turns into a retirement fund. Sounds good. I thought it sounded great. The people that sold me on it who worked for State Farm who were paid commission for everything I sold they believed in it uh, they had to believe in it because that's how they got paid that's how they kept their jobs that's how they got promoted so <laughs> remember this is back before 2008 before the financial crisis and remember what triggered the financial crisis in 2008 it was real estate mortgage-backed securities it was this huge inflation of home prices imagine that does that sound familiar this massive inflation of home prices and this incentive for everybody to get another loan to buy another house uh, so that they could keep the, the machine running. And so the federal government made it super easy to get a Fannie Mae loan, to get a, a loan that was basically certified by the government. And then all of these, uh, all of these mortgage brokers, they had no rules, no boundaries, no limitations. It was unbelievable how lax it was in terms of underwriting for the, for the, the loans back then. Now that's changed today because of 2008, but what's not changed is that this bubble in the stock market that's being created again by the federal government, the federal government is always involved in creating these bubbles and then they're the first ones, no, they're not the first ones. They eventually show up with a fire extinguisher and a few thousand fire trucks, no, a couple of squirt guns is really what they show up with, a 25 basis point rate increase is what they showed up with this week. But again, remember what caused the crash of 2008? Now we have a similar kind of thing brewing. Uh, lots of differences. I've preached enough about the Fed and what's going on in the market. I hope you will join me. I hope you'll listen to the podcast because I'm going to share on the Missional Money podcast. I'm going to share these little videos as I create the training lessons for investing, for investment management, and we're going to start with four investment strategies. It's been spring break this week, so my students at the University of Houston have been off, and I've been working on uh, the content for this week's lesson. Well, this week and next week and the next several weeks, I'm going to be teaching about investing. I'm going to be teaching about investment management, and I'm going to be teaching about investment strategies. And like I said a few minutes ago, I'm working on my trader's manifesto. I'm going to start by teaching 
teaching you the difference between an investor and a trader and why I'm a trader. Why not a trader, but a trader. Like I trade stocks. I don't invest and hold, buy and hold. I don't do that for my clients. I don't do that for myself. When I was a State Farm agent, I sold mutual funds. And believe me, the system is set up so that you buy and hold because you can't buy and sell. You get in big trouble for that. And it doesn't work with the types of investments that you have when you're a State Farm agent. Then I left State Farm. I went to work on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley in the Wealth Management Department because I wanted to learn after the crash, after I put all these people in these funds and watched those funds disintegrate, they didn't disintegrate. They dropped 40, 45 percent. But the reason they dropped is because of this bubble that was created in the Fed and a credit crisis happened. And that's what caused the stock market to crash. And that's what causes the stock market to crash pretty much every time. And believe me, it's going to happen again because it's inevitable. It's <laughs> But that doesn't don't don't be afraid of that. I have I have so much uh, hope and uh, optimism about the market. The point is, though, you have to be able to trade. You can't be buy and hold like I was when I was a State Farm agent. In fact, you can't be like I was as a Morgan Stanley financial advisor my team so first of all let me just remind you when i was a state farm agent and i was selling mutual funds state farms mutual funds had no real estate in them when i would talk and i was in clear lake texas so when i would talk to a rather sophisticated client and i would tell them about our product which i liked the life path fund by barclays was a good fund for most people we had lower than average expenses and a little better than average returns. That's what I would tell people. And you got, if you let me help you with your mutual funds, you got a certified financial planner who helped you put together a reasonably solid financial plan to boot. So that's why I did it. I wanted to help my clients. But remember, those funds had no real estate in them. So if you looked at the prospectus, you'd be like, real estate's gone through the roof. It's the most high performing asset class on the charts. And it was in 2007 and six and five. Real estate shot up so much because there was a bubble brewing. State Farm had no real estate in their portfolio and the life path funds. Eventually they added it like in 2007, they added real estate. Imagine that. It's like putting a poison pill at the very end of the rally. They add it to their mutual funds. So my clients, it's just, it's how it works. It's how Wall Street works. People were complaining. Clients, customers were complaining. Agents were complaining. Registered reps were complaining because we didn't have real estate and real estate was the most exciting asset class until it wasn't which is when 2008 hit so then i go to work i i gave everything up at state farm because i was up to here with being a captive agent i wanted to learn more about investment management so i went to work at morgan stanley in the wealth management department i wanted to learn about investing the team that i worked for uh, I trusted them, I liked them, they were good people, but they had this, their strategy for managing investments. I didn't have a choice because when you start at Morgan Stanley, you start as a, a trainee, a trainee, a financial advisor trainee, FAA is what it's called. So I didn't have a choice. I couldn't go build my own portfolios. Um, I had to use what the team had and it was all approved by Morgan Stanley. Well, I started to watch, I put my money in those portfolios because I always put my money in whatever I'm selling, okay? When I was a State Farm agent, I invested in those mutual funds that I sold other people because it made sense. It made it easy to sell too because 
If I didn't believe in it enough to invest in it, why should I be selling it to you? I believe that then, I believe that now. When I went to Morgan Stanley, I believed that then, I believe that now. The problem was, at Morgan Stanley, what I was selling, what my team had created in terms of a portfolio up there in the Williams Tower, was what I came to call affectionately the apocalypse portfolio because it was after 2008 and the team who was making the decisions on the investment portfolio they were still <clears throat> excuse me they were still shell shocked because of what happened in 2008 so they were avoiding all of the asset classes that were really growing and they were investing in precious metals and it was a disaster I ended up having Having clients who were longtime clients that came with me to Morgan Stanley uh, from State Farm, I had clients who just left. They didn't just leave. They asked me to help them transition to something else, like an annuity with guaranteed income, which was a terrible, not a terrible thing. It wasn't anyway, it is what it is. My point is the apocalypse portfolio, yeah. It's not a bad idea. It's easy to sell, especially when there's fear and blood in the streets. But like Warren, Warren Buffett says, the best time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. One more story about Morgan Stanley and my experience at Morgan Stanley that made me, it gave me the confidence to know that I could do this better, this investment management thing. I could do it better than anyone I knew not because I'm smarter, not because I'm better, but because I'm independent, because I'm a fiduciary and I'm not attached to a system that pays me for certain things. So for example, Morgan Stanley has what they call the GIC, the Global Investment Committee. They're seriously smart dudes and ladies. And they are smart and they have this massive research department behind them. And we were including in our apocalypse portfolio, we had this, uh, we called it a sleeve and everybody got a piece of this sleeve. It was uh, MLPs. So MLPs, just think of high dividend, kind of junk bonds in the oil and gas business but it was paying high dividends. And it was like the 2007, 2006 real estate asset. It was going up, up, up. It just kept going up, up, up. Everybody wanted a piece of this asset class because it had such high dividend distribution. But I looked at that and I thought, for my clients who are retired, that's a lot of risk. All you had to do is look at a chart and see how high the MLP sector had gone. It was just like that real estate sector. This happens over and over. It's like it's a repeatable pattern in every asset class. Think about oil today. Think about where oil was not that long ago, like in 2020 when it was trading at $30 negative <laughs> and like a week ago it was trading at 140 bucks a barrel here's what happened at morgan stanley those mlps just kept going higher and higher and morgan stanley the geek the really smart people at the global investment committee they were in telling our team that this is a good asset class you should keep this uh you know, weighted in your portfolios. In other words, we should keep it in our portfolios. And that was their advice. And we were following it. And I was thinking, this is crazy. And I told my team, this is crazy. But because I was the rookie on the team, they're like, yeah, you're not, yeah, we're not taking direction from you. But I knew it was a problem. And I, I, I watched it and then oil started trading I want to say it was $26 a barrel. I can't remember exactly what month, but you can check the charts. And oil dropped and gas was selling at a buck and a quarter a gallon, okay? And I remember calling one of my best clients and I said, look, 
this is it's time to invest in some oil and gas stocks so at the time I said we need to buy some Conoco Phillips I got his permission because then I was not discretionary in other words I had to get every clients permission every time I made a trade so I got his permission I told him what I thought why I thought it basically the conversation went like this hey do you think gas is going to be trading do you think you're going to be able to buy gasoline at a buck and a quarter for very long how long do you think that's going to last? It's not going to last long. So the fact that this company's stock is in the commode, it's a great opportunity. And it was. It's a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer. Okay, now here's what is phenomenally crazy to me. The GIC, the Global Investment Committee at Morgan Stanley, they were saying, yeah, there's quite a bit of risk in that sector. We think you should take off some of that risk. You should underweight that asset class, maybe avoid it altogether. Can you imagine? So I'm doing the opposite because now I'm looking at this chart that was way up here and it's so far depressed because of the fear, because of the fact that oil had dropped so much. I'm thinking this is a great time to buy. These companies are still paying high dividends and yes, there are some of these companies are going to go belly up but some of them are going to buy the other ones or be bought and these prices are going to be this is an opportunity look here's my point i hope you will follow me in the next few weeks and months because i'm going to be teaching about investing investment strategies investment management and i want i want to be very clear and very transparent in the way that i trade and so I want to do that for my clients. I want to do it for my students. Uh, I want to do it for the families I serve and for the families that I don't serve who are being served by somebody like who I was when I didn't know what I know today. Um, so I'm going to be teaching these uh, strategies, these principles, uh, this system, if you will, and it's all education. There's no guarantee. I promise you, you can lose money investing no matter how good your system is. But you got to have a system. You have to have some rules, boundaries, and limitations. You need to understand investing, even if you're a client or not a client, if you're a student or not a student, if you're doing it yourself or you're paying someone else to do it, you need to understand investing and investment strategies and investment management enough to be part of the conversation, okay? If you're one of my clients, I'm gonna be giving you the opportunity to make some changes in your accounts. Changes that give me the ability to do things like use options to manage risk and opportunity. So not only options, but I'm going to be selling stocks short. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not for a long time. But as we get these asset classes like we've seen over and over and over get inflated, I'm going to be watching the market and I'm going to have my finger on my mouse. And then when the time comes and when the signals come and when the confirmation comes and when the setup is just right, I'm going to push the button and I'm going to short some stuff. And I'm going to I'm going to bring some clients into that process. And if you're one of those people that it just starts making sense to you that these patterns are repeating, that's what trading is. It's about paying attention to the patterns. I'm not a day trader. I never want to be a day trader. This week I watched the charts way too much. I don't want to watch the charts every day as much as I did this week. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to have a great system where I pay attention to the charts on a regular basis. I'm going to have some very clear rules boundaries and limitations for my own trading and I'm going to trade my money, my family's money and my clients money with the kind of system that can make us money whether the market's going up, down or sideways. No guarantee and, and this, is, uh, this is not a sales pitch. I'm just telling you what I'm excited about no matter what happens in the market I'm no longer going to be I haven't been a buy and hold guy forever I never was a buy and hold guy that never made sense to me 
but I've never been as active a trader as I'm going to be. If you have tax qualified accounts, which most of my money is, because you know I was born on April 15th, you know my first son was born, my first child was born December 31st, so I got a tax deduction for the entire year. My second son was born on October 15th, which is the day you file your taxes if you're a business owner. So taxes and tax deductions, they've made sense to me most of my life. And so I've invested in a tax advantaged way and I'm going to be teaching you what that means, why the type of account matters. So if you're tax advantaged like I am, you can make these trades without having any taxable event. You don't pay tax on the gains. That's huge. If you're not in a tax advantaged account, then we have other strategies that we can use where we can use margin, we can use options, we can short step, short sell, short sell stocks. You can't do that in a tax qualified account, but you can in a non tax qualified account. These strategies are new to Bayrock, my company. They're new for me. They're not new for me. They're new for my trading strategies. And I have not made them available to clients in the past because of the risk profile. So if you're one of those investors who's doing it yourself and you have a, the right risk profile, I hope you'll join me. I want to teach you how this works. I want to collaborate with you. We're going to be doing some things that are going to be fun. So check it out. Go to go to missionalmoney.com. Make sure you're signed up, subscribed to the podcast, and get yourself into the free course that's being made available. It's not going to be free forever, but the course, if you're a client, a Bayrock client, it's always free for you and your family and anyone you want to uh, send over missionalmoney.com get subscribe to the podcast enroll in the course and let's make a plan you'll see the three buttons at the top of the page and that's how you get started so i hope i didn't ramble too much today i know i did ramble quite a bit but i have a lot on my mind i'm excited about where we're going i hope you'll be a part of it if you're not already Go to missionalmoney.com, subscribe to the podcast, enroll in the course, and let's make a plan. You'll get registered in the Bayrock Planning Portal. Again, this is all free. It won't be free forever unless you're a client, in which case it will always be free. I'm at a light. I better get pay attention. I'm on a busy road now. So I will see you next week.